Hello everybody and welcome to tonight's uh, Architects Bookshop Isolation Talk number 9. Thanks for joining us. We've got 313 people viewing us at once at the moment, which is fantastic. Let me just show you me. I'm Adam, for those of you who don't know me. <laughs> I run and own the bookshop. Um, so again, thanks for being here. Um, we've had a really amazing um, response to um, these talks from people all around the globe. So I just wanted to say hello to everybody in the UK and in um, Italy, um, in Europe, anywhere throughout Asia, because I know we've got a lot of people watching, even got people in Tassie watching. So hello to the Tas region down there on your very safe island. Um, so tonight we're going to talk to um, Philip Vivian. Philip, who is a partner at um, Bait Smart. Hello, Philip. Good day, Adam. <laughs> where are you? Where are you tonight? You're allowed to be. You're allowed to be honest and tell us exactly where you are. <laughs> uh, I'm at a. <laughs> I'm up the New South Wales coast at a place called Pacific Palms, where nice. I've had, been with the family for about six weeks in isolation. Yep, it's been great. Yeah, nice, 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 nice. When do your kids go back to school? Uh, I think we're at the end of week two, and they go back in week six. Yeah, so right. we've got another week or two up here, and then we'll come back to hopefully resume some kind of. Uh, post-COVID normal life. Oh, good. Good to hear. And how's the office going? Uh, interestingly, surprisingly well. Um, we've had very few jobs cancelled. Um, uh, there's been an amazing transition to working from home, um, probably thanks to our uh, practice managers and our IT. It's been almost seamless. How many, um, how many people are you in Sydney? In Sydney, around 150. Yep. Uh, but we're we're probably expecting the fallout from this to be in the second half of this year and into 2021. Yeah. Um, but relatively isolated from problems at the moment. Touch wood. Yeah. Good. 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 Well, for everybody, I met Philip um, actually at university. He, I was lucky enough to have Philip as one of my tutors in. I think I can't remember if it was first year or third year, but left quite an impression. <laughs> um, Philip, as I said, is a partner at Bates Smart. He's based in Sydney and has uh, moved to Sydney uh, to run the practice, I think, in around 99. Philip, if I'm, if that's if I'm correct, I think. Uh, yep, 97. 90, oh, 97, wow, that was a super early. Um, so yeah, he moved to, moved to Sydney to set up the practice. And I think one of the most interesting things for me uh, about Bates Smart is they are completely multi-generational, over 160 years old, and they're one of the few firms I think probably globally who have been able to deliver good work and continue to deliver good work um, through the generations. There's lots of big practices or successful practices, I would say, who have made significant marks architecturally and then have failed to be able to transition that across generations. But Bates have done it exceptionally well and are continuing to do it. Um, they produce um, remarkable projects, I think, uh, projects that are incredible in their ability to balance um, the kind of making of the city, the, the requirements of a client, and often incredibly hard-nosed clients, but also to produce beauty and joy, which is, I think, incredibly significant given the type of environment that we often find ourselves, particularly in Sydney. Um, Philip tonight is going to talk about some investigations that he has done and the office has done into making the city better, making the city a better place. And I think one of the things that I love about that is every time a bigger international competition comes out, I think, why would we all run for the same job? Why don't we all just work on a project that we think could be better for the city and propose that out there? And I think. Um, hopefully tonight Philip is going to show us the kind of value in doing that as an exercise. So Philip, without further ado, I'll just hand over to you. Okay, thank you Adam and thanks for that introduction and especially thank you to you and to the Architects Bookshop for hosting these um, isolation talks and I, I hope they're of value to everyone while we're all um, in these circumstances. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the country throughout Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture um, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, tonight's talk, as Adam mentioned, is called Sydney Visions. 
Um, and what it is is a collection of um, six projects um, at varying scales um, that we've been doing over the last seven years. And they're projects that we've done um, as a pro bono project or what, I, what I've been calling a sort of advocacy by design or almost in some cases an sense of architectural activism. Um, they are, so they're unpaid, they're, they're really critiques of some of the political decision making in our city where there's been a lack of what I'd call integrated urban thinking. Um, and these projects often involve urban infrastructure and they question the issue of siloed thinking and the problems of governance boundaries between different government agencies. In other words, when, when government agencies aren't talking to each other to give the best outcome. Um, you'll see in the projects, they address issues of affordable housing, value capture, um, compact high density clusters, sustainable transport, the post-automobile city, leveraging air rights and dismantling 20th century infrastructure. Um, and they're all based on a, a belief and a love of the city and a belief that the city should be sustainable, resilient and equitable. So I'll give you a quick introduction to thoughts on cities before we get into these. Um, so cities occupy 2% of the Earth's surface and yet they create 80% of the global economic output um, of the world. Um, this is one of my favourite quotes. It's from the former mayor of Denver, in which he said the 19th century was a century of empires, the 20th century is a, was a century of nation states, and the 21st century will be a century of cities. And I think we can all see that with the movement back into the cities and the regeneration of cities in the 21st century. Um, at the moment, we have a global population, or two years ago, of 7.8 billion, um, and that is predicted to grow to 9.8 billion by 2050. Um, but a more, even more compelling statistic is the percentage of that population that's urbanised. Um, so today we have 54% or 4.2 billion people living in cities, but by 2050, it's going to be 75% or 7.35 billion. So you can see there's an almost doubling of the, um, the urbanised population. Um, in the future. And, and so the future of the world's urban population between now and 2050 will mostly be built in our lifetime. And it's critical that I think we make um, important decisions in the next few years. So what are the challenges of cities in the 21st century? Um, and I've uh, narrowed it down, if you like, um, to three, uh, I think, quintessential challenges. Um, the first is this issue of rapid urbanisation um, that you've just seen a little bit about the global statistics. And the second issue is climate change uh, and the need for us to uh, operate it as a lower carbon um, economy. And the third is urban inequality. And I'm just going to unpack those um, three a little bit before we get into the projects. And if we start with rapid urbanisation, when we look back just over 100 years, there was only 10% of people um, living in cities of the global population. A few years ago, we passed 50% for the first time in the history of humanity. Um, and as of a few years ago, we were at 54% living in cities. And as I mentioned before, by 2050, we're predicted to go to 75% urbanised. This is one of the, the, the greatest um, mass urbanisations in the history of humankind. Um, and so dealing with that in the next 30 years is one of our great challenges. Um, based on those statistics, clearly urban life is the new normal. We are, by the vast majority, living in cities. But cities um, consume vast amounts of energy and they are responsible for 75% of our greenhouse gas emissions. And obviously we need to bring those down in the 21st century to deal with climate change. Um, there is only one earth um, and it is fragile as we have seen this century. Um, 
But I do like this quote from Tony Shee, um, who says, if you fix cities, you kind of fix the world. And he's looking at the fact that really 80% of or 75% of greenhouse gases are coming out of cities. So if we transform cities, we're really kind of fixing the world. Um, and that's one of the primary reasons why Bait Smart was one of the founding signatories of Australian architects declare a climate and biodiversity emergency. And I do hope that everyone out there has um, registered on that page um, and joined, uh, joined the fight. Um, and the last issue is the issue of urban inequality. And it's appalling that in the 21st century, still one third of all city dwellers globally live in slums. Um, now, that's not something that affects um, our city, Sydney, uh, although the issues of inequality, the issues of uh, key worker housing, affordable housing and social housing are very real issues in our city um, to create a more equitable and a more just city. So if we get on to these urban visions and look, they were inspired by, uh, in a sense, Buckminster Fuller, who's quote was the best way to predict the future is to design it and I guess as architects one of our core skills is design and if we're looking to how to influence the future or predict it perhaps we should just use that core skill and that's what these projects represent. So this is an aerial view of our beautiful city of Sydney and today we are 4.8 million people but by 2050, we are predicted to grow to 8 million people. Now, currently we uh, have a, a fairly dense monocentric city core and we're surrounded by very low density um, suburban surrounds. And it's a highly unsustainable form of development and a very carbon intensive um, form of urbanization. And it's wholly reliant on um, the automobile as a form of transport to get around places. And that again is, you know, they're very carbon intensive forms of transport. And I think probably unsustainable as we move into the 21st century. Um, so our city, uh, some of the problems is clearly congestion. Uh, we've got long commutes. Uh, we're suffering the adverse effects of climate change and we've got inaccessibility to public transport and decreasing housing affordability and access to jobs. So the question is, how do we urbanise this next 3.2 million people um, in the next 30 years, whilst also reducing carbon emissions and increasing our socioeconomic quality of our city? So the first project we looked at, which is very big picture, is just questioning the idea of Sydney as a polycentric megacity. Um, now, uh, as you probably know, mega cities are cities of 10 million people or more. Um, we are heading to 8 million in Sydney. Um, there's over a million in Canberra and close to a million in Newcastle. So it does question, could we be or should we be a, a, a polycentric city? And it is based on some of the work by Lord Richard Rogers in his book, um, Cities for a Small Planet, that proposed clusters of high density urbanisation um, at nodes on high speed transport or rapid sustainable transport routes. Now the Greater Sydney Commission has um, proposed a polycentric city in a way, it's a, they call it a city of three cities um, with one city being really an aerotropolis in Western Sydney Airport and I guess we we questioned is uh, what was the precedent for this and does um, an aerotropolis really constitute a form of a city or should we be thinking of um, three cities but connecting um, Sydney to Newcastle and Canberra. That's um, That image is the current extent of urbanisation at the moment and you can see uh, we are almost continuously urbanised from Sydney north and connecting to Newcastle. Now, when we look at the opportunities for growth, um, Sydney is surrounded by National Park. 
um, and clearly we don't want to grow into that national park. So where are we going to accommodate that extra 3.2 million people um, and ideally without um, continuing to sprawl? And so we, we looked at the idea of could we introduce a high speed rail link from Canberra to Newcastle? Now, there's been a lot of high speed rail proposals in Australia. Um, most of them are between Sydney and Melbourne. Um, there's also some between Sydney and Brisbane. And the idea of these links is really to revitalise our regional towns. And I guess the difference with this proposal is the belief that rather than revitalising regional towns, it's about energising city centres and connecting um, high density city centres um, and making them into a single conurbation. And so if we look at um, a link as shown there, uh, high speed rail from Newcastle through Sydney to Canberra, we could really create the opportunity to live um, as a single integrated city where you can commute between these various cities on a daily basis. Um, if you look at the commute times at the moment, um, currently Newcastle to Sydney takes um, close to three hours by rail. By high speed rail, that would be down to 32 minutes. Um, if you look at Canberra to Sydney, uh, currently it's over four hours um, by rail, that would reduce to one hour. So this is making these cities almost like outer suburbs of Sydney. And then if you look at the total distance, currently it's seven hours uh, from Newcastle to Canberra, um, that would come down to an hour and a half. Now, the interesting thing is that that makes, gives you a different view of infrastructure. So perhaps rather than a second airport at Badgeries Creek, um, we would suggest that the second airport's already built. We have an international terminal at Canberra, um, just one hour from Sydney. Um, it increases housing choice about where you want to live and what sort of lifestyle you have. Um, it certainly impacts on housing affordability. If we look at the median house price in Sydney of 860,000 um, and you look at the at Canberra, um, 558, you're literally two thirds of the price in Canberra, approximately the same in Newcastle and in the Central Coast, 69% um, of the price of Sydney. So it certainly deals with um, the issue of affordable housing and lifestyle choice and makes us think of our infrastructure in a more holistic way than just city by city. And indeed, we have the challenge with Canberra as being a different state. And shouldn't we be thinking and planning at a, a larger scale level? Um, so that would take currently, that is our urbanised area. Um, clearly, we need to protect our green belt, but the city of 2050 with over 10 million people could be a mega city on the east coast connected by high speed rail. Um, the next project we called urban infrastructure housing and it was done in response to a call by the um, city of Sydney to say how can we create affordable housing in our city. Um, and our approach, we looked at the local government area, the city of Sydney, and we looked at the where the public land is. Now, a, approximately 35% of the cost of any housing is the cost of land, it's the land value. And we felt that if, if the land was already publicly owned, it's essentially free. So we could reduce the cost of public housing by one third. Um, about 15% of the city is uh, public recreation, green space, about 15 or 14% is un unzoned or major development and education space. And there's about 2% shown in red that are that is rail infrastructure corridors that weave through the city. And we thought that gave us great potential for housing. We looked at um, where the current rail network is and rail stations. And clearly, if we could build affordable housing um, close to rail stations, it's a much more affordable, um, well, sorry, affordable and sustainable form of housing. And so we, we then drew uh, 400 metre radius around the stations, um, being a, a walking distance. And we proposed that the, the density 
on each of these stations was the the density of adjoining land plus a 20 percent bonus um, if you're within 400 meters of a station um, on the provision that there was no car parking on the site and so that people would not be adding vehicular traffic they would be traveling by the existing train network so it's a um, a sustainability um, density increase we then looked at the technology for building over rail corridors um, so this is a, a generic rail corridor um, separating two sides of of um, a community and uh, there's the technology to create a prefabricated land deck with prefabricated concrete beams that can be dropped in. Um, in. In New York at Hudson Yards, those beams are extraordinary uh, lengths, but here we're looking at 18 metre prefabricated beams, very easy to get on site. Um, we also looked at the idea of prefabricated housing modules so that they were quick and cost effective to erect um, and also had the ability for disassembly. Uh, and we proposed a model that would be based on build to rent so that the government would not be um, dealing with hundreds of individual building owners. There would be a, a single building owner um, build to rent and these sites would be tended to a build to rent operator with the requirement that a minimum of one third, in other words, the land value was provided as affordable housing and managed by the build to rent operator. Um, and that that is a minimum, but someone could, their tender could say, we will provide 50% of affordable housing. And then the final principle was that whatever got built on these sites, there should be tangible public benefit. And we're showing here in this situation, the idea of um, connecting um, two communities across the rail, um, providing green open space, and of course, uh, designing it such that there is solar access to those public spaces. Now, we we tested that um, and we thought this was a good test site. This, for those of you who don't know, is called the Goulburn Street um, Car Park. It's owned by the City of Sydney um, and it is built um, over the rail infrastructure, very much like the system I just showed you. And it currently has 750 cars. And I guess the challenge to the city of Sydney was uh, the city says, well, we want affordable housing. They're also saying we want a more humane city and a city that isn't about cars. And yet this, this site is occupied by 750 cars. And we said, well, really, shouldn't it be occupied by affordable housing? And we created a, a very quick conceptual scheme that um, offered 460 affordable housing units on that site instead of cars. Um, now, just to give you an overview of that site, uh, we can afford to build uh, two taller buildings. This is complying with LEP height limits and overshadowing requirements. Um, and these buildings uh, taper down to meet the street um, and they are offset and they get the two hours required of solar access. And so that would take the current Goulburn Street car park from this to this. Um, where we are looking at the idea of stacking up um, prefabricated uh, timber housing. You can see it's the, the warm timber um, with a shoshugi barn finish on the outside, a, a black stained timber. So it would be a, affordable housing that's sustainable and made of timber in the centre of the city with 460 affordable units instead of for 750 cars. So what did the city say about this? Uh, well, Adam, uh, I, they shortlisted, I think, three or four schemes, we, and we weren't one of the shortlists. Yeah, right. Um, Why now, do, you think, I, do you think it was too practical? <laughs> uh, I think it, when you really dig down to it, the infrastructure land is actually owned by the state government. Right. And I think there's a challenge in the city and the state despite both wanting affordable housing in getting together and agreeing that that's the right thing yeah so i think it was looked at as well we don't actually own that land yeah is is one suspicion yeah 
the challenge with a whole lot of different agencies all trying to do their own thing, but no one talking together. Exactly. And that's what I was saying in the introduction. It's about those governmental boundaries and siloed thinking. Mm. Uh, but we have shown that clearly the state has already given the city the license to build the um, Goulburn Street car park yeah. um, and many years ago, and it's an eyesore today. Um, and perhaps the city could just start there and demonstrate mm -hmm. and then from a successful outcome, perhaps look at the other sites. And I'm showing we did very quick concept schemes throughout the city, yeah. uh, showed that there's potentially over 6,000 affordable units um, close to metro rail or sorry, close to heavy rail um, in the city of Sydney. Um, and I'd suggest that that goes a long way to providing um, affordable housing. And I will just remind you what that number is based on a 20% FSR increase relative to the adjoining land. Mm. It's interesting because we had Jeremy um, a cloud speak earlier in the week and he um, was talking about the fact that as a nation we're the wealthiest we've ever been, but we've got the most homeless people we've ever had. That yes. Kind of, that kind of parallel, yeah, that think depressing parallel. It's one of the, the horrible things about the 21st century is the increasing inequality and the concentration of wealth in the um, 1%. Um, and really, I think we all need to be looking out for how do we create more equitable cities for the other 99%. Yeah. Um, then this, this third project um, was actually probably the first one that we did, and it's going back about seven years. Um, and it, it's going back to a time when the, the first metro was actually cancelled in the city. So um, we didn't have a metro and we were asked to study how do you increase height limits in the city of Sydney? And our first reaction was, well, how can you propose increasing height limits and therefore density um, with our current transport system, which is at capacity? And we looked at global cities and we realised that Sydney was the only global city without a metro transport network. Um, it had heavy rail, but no metro. And so it was really a critique of the government cancelling um, metro. Uh, a little bit of how dare they. Um, now, in this proposal, you can see the blue dots. We propose the heavy rail finish either end of the city, which is North Sydney here and central, and that we then go to a a localised metro transport network within the inner ring. So we were trying to marry up the two systems. Um, and we said within 200 metres of a metro station, so this new transport network, um, we would allow what we called super tall buildings, which were really just buildings over the current height limit allowed under the city's LEP. And we thought what was interesting about that is that the, the morphology of the city, uh, the shape of it would start to follow the public transport network by allowing this increased height. Um, and so you would get a, a series of clusters uh, related to metro stations through the city. Uh, and that shows you the idea this is our existing city and the new transport stops and the idea of this increased height and density around those transport stops. Um, and the idea of the shape of the city changing. Um, you can see our current city shape is um, starting to end up with uh, quite a flat top, and that is actually by design. Um, no building is allowed to be higher than the tallest point of centre point tower. Um, if you look at the extruding the LEP to the maximum heights, you can see that that flat top is designed and then it does taper down to, to ensure that centre point remains a, a central point in the city. Um, and you can see that extra height at the bottom. And then what we were proposing is that actually you can break those heights. And interestingly, it creates a city of hills and valleys and centre point tower sits in one of those valleys. Um, and maintains its uh, hierarchy, if you believe in that. Um, that would take our city from looking like that today to that tomorrow. Um, now that's, it's a bit of a, a shift and I'll talk about that in a minute, but we're also interested in the idea of how could we capture the value created. And so we looked at all of the area above the existing height limits, which is shown in gray, 
and we measured the the extra floor space above those height limits and said how can we capture that value now as some of you will know our city already has a mechanism to transfer um, value from heritage sites to other sites through it's called heritage floor space and that has a dollar value and we simply proposed a similar mechanism whereby you could buy space above the existing height limit but that the, would be bought from the state government to offset the cost of metro so we were, this extra height was actually paying for uh, the delivery of metro and we calculated how much um, floor space there was um, about 4.8 million square meters of floor space and we amortized that out to 2050 and the midpoint 2032 uh, that had a a value of $7.1 billion, which would pay for 50% of the cost of Metro. Um, and we still think that when this, the government is building a Metro system, they should be looking at the uplift around Metro stations and capturing some of the value rather than it going purely to um, developers who happen to own land or who have bought it um, and get the windfall gain of increased densities around metro stations. Um, now, showing people this image, and we we intentionally made some of those towers extremely tall. Um, I will admit, uh, because it was really it was an exercise in high impact about change. But we did sort of we did look back at the the city, um, and we. We looked in 30 year increments because 2050 is 30 years approximately from today. We looked back at 1934 um, with Sydney as a low rise city. And then we looked at the mid 1960s, the beginning of Sydney as a high rise city. Um, now, actually, this was, I'm embarrassed to say, this is within my lifetime. Um, that's how Sydney looked. And I would challenge you to, that if you told anyone that from back then that our city would look like this today, um, you would get a very shocked reaction. And I think when we put this image up, um, we get a, a similar shock, um, but I think we just need to start thinking, what is our city of tomorrow? Because I don't think it will stay static. And we have shown that um, cities grow over 30 year periods quite astronomically. And so what is our city of tomorrow? What will it look like? And what, feedback, um, what kind of feedback did you get from that, Philip? Um, look, there was a lot of media interest, Adam. Um, this is one of the articles. Uh, there were radio shows. I think it, um, in a positive way, brought up the, the discussion. I think there was a lot of feedback about what is the future of our city. Um, and... Look, I, I think it's good for public debate to be, well, is this the right way to go? Mm -hmm. Our city um, was, I think, in a sense, artificially frozen at the height of um, the Centrepoint Tower, which was built in the 1970s. And so we've, we've used that as a, a high point, and it's very like Philadelphia, which um, had a, an informal rule, you can't build buildings above the height of William Penn's statue. And it literally froze the city for decades until they broke that rule. And I, I think this was proposing the same thing. It's just questioning, is that artificial height limit of the top of Centrepoint Tower um, relevant to our city in the 21st century? And is indeed the Centrepoint Tower relevant as a, a Centrepoint um, for Sydney in this day and age? Yeah. So I think it was good public debate, Adam, would be yeah. my, my thought. Um, and clearly, as I said, those towers are pushed really to, if we'd been tame about it, I think it might not have stirred up enough controversy for people to uh, have the worry. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. Um, but if you, if you fast forward, and this is now seven years hence, um, Metro is back. Um, so this is a complete change from the environment we were in. Um, and so I'm very happy to say the New South Wales government's now building uh, the metro network or the first line of what I think needs to be uh, an integrated um, sustainable transport network for our city. I think building metro is the future of Sydney to give us a sustainable transport network. 
and it's great we're on the first line and we're thinking about uh, Metro West. Um, the other thing that's happened since then is the City of Sydney's exhibited their draft Central Sydney planning strategy, which has proposed clusters of tall buildings. Um, and these, these clusters are related purely to overshadowing of public spaces, which we fully support. I think the uh, downside is that they're not related to a transport network. So um, they're not at locations of um, sustainable transport. But I guess we um, not claiming that we influenced either of those, but it is very nice to see some of that thinking has come back and um, uh, we're looking, could our city transform in that way in 30 years time? Um, quite a dramatic shift, I recognise. Um, and could it still maintain the romance that we think is is Sydney, um, that we, we all know and love? Uh, the third, uh, sorry, probably the fourth project is called Sydney Stadium. Um, and this was a project, it, it was generated by the fact that the state government proposed to demolish um, this stadium, um, Allianz Stadium, and rebuild it in the exact same location at a cost of close to a billion dollars. Um, and the stadium sits within parkland, it's part of the more parklands, um, and it's surrounded by parking because there isn't um, a um, public transport network uh, to allow you to get close to the stadium. There is now a light rail um, running past here, but light rail doesn't have the capacity to move 80,000 people um, in an hour. Um, and there was a general outrage in the press that we that the state government would waste it, it would seem this much money interestingly we thought it's actually a good decision for for sport to build a a new stadium and it's a good decision for transport but the criticism was really there was no integrated thinking from a the point of view of the city and how do you build a a city with when you're spending a billion dollars shouldn't it benefit the broader city um, not just sport and tourism one of the challenges here is when people spill out, they, they are literally hooligans through Paddington and Surrey Hills because there is nowhere to go and be entertained and actually get that, those economic multiplier effects of hosting a major event. Um, so these are some of the articles that appeared um, with the state government um, under a lot of fire, actually, about spending a billion dollars to just rebuild a, a stadium. Um, meanwhile, not far away, the, the central government was thinking, what do they do to build over um, central station rail yards? And we started thinking, well, wouldn't that be a, a great location for a stadium? Um, it's the, the single most con public transport connected node in the whole of New South Wales. Um, and so you've actually got, uh, you've got a bus terminal on the west side. Uh, the, the new light rail goes straight past that. Uh, the suburban rail lines all come past and there's a new metro line. And really, with all those public transport nodes, that is how you move large numbers of people in relatively short amounts of time and seem to us the ideal location for a stadium. Um, I will say we did work with um, Andrew Johnson of Arup to talk about is it possible to build a stadium on on a land deck over rail, um, and he confirmed it's equivalent to about a six-storey building. And one of the very interesting things is that the, the lateral load of a, a circular structure can be taken out in the circle. So it was a quite a possible um, engineering uh, solution. And we saw the stadium as a generator of activity that would actually connect Surrey Hills um, to Chippendale um, and cause uh, uh, the development of the rest of the central rail yards development. So there would be additional development over there anchored by this stadium. And that would take central rail yards from this uh, to this. And I think one of the, the great benefits is that you would have a stadium embedded in the urban fabric. Um, it's a great urban spectacle. Um, you can imagine drones taking shots of games at night with the city in the background and the harbour and really selling Sydney as a, an alive, vibrant city. 
And then you get all the spillover benefits of after the game, 80,000 people um, pouring into um, Surrey Hills and Chippendale, where there are restaurants, bars um, and the city itself. And so we thought that was a, a great benefit for the city, not just for sport. But then there were, there were additional benefits in that whilst the stadium's being built, which is two and a half years, sometimes close to three years, you lose all the major, major um, events. Well, in our proposal, you could keep the major events going whilst you are um, building the new stadium. But most importantly, when it's finished, we could return um, more park and have more park in more park. So that it would actually be returned to a parkland for the people and the stadium would be embedded in the city. Um, that did garner a lot of international press, and this is an example of just, just some of those articles, local press and international, I should say. Um, now, interestingly, uh, we did try to take this idea originally to the Premier. We did think it was a, a great idea that she should run with. Um, and we got through to the Premier's department. Unfortunately, um, some of you will remember she had backed down on refurbishing the stadium out at Sydney Olympic Park, and it was determined that it would be political suicide to also then say, I've also changed my mind about um, Allianz Stadium. And so the Premier, on political grounds, could not run with the idea. Um, but the opposition did pick up the idea when the election came. And, uh, some Those in New South Wales may remember the opposition said, we will not build a stadium in Moore Park. Um, and they did. Uh, there was some costing done on this idea. Um, it's quite depressing that it's not happening because it would have made absolute sense to build it on top of the railway line. It, it made a lot of sense to us, Adam, and... Um, Again, we were on. I was on Talkback Radio, um, and look, one of the interesting things about Talkback, I find, is you you always get polarised opinions. You get people yeah. at either extreme. Um, I got no one saying that's a ridiculous idea. Mm. We had people ringing up just saying that is brilliant. Why aren't we doing it? Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Um, I mean, I remember, it, I remember it coming out thinking that is an absolute no-brainer. Why don't we just do that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yep. And it's. It's politics, mm. sadly. Yeah. Uh, and we honestly thought, you, you probably remember the, the amount of flack that um, Gladys Berejiklian was uh, copying back then. We honestly thought that it would help her politically. Mm -hmm. uh, but I can see uh, look, you know, there's a certain amount of political naivety. And as I said, this is really, it's maybe advocacy by design, but it's, it's not politics. But yeah. we thought we were helping politically. Um, so to finish with, I've got a couple of projects that really talk about um, what is life going to be like in the 21st century, a kind of life after cars. Um, and I think on, the image on the right is an example of 20th century infrastructure for the cars. Um, and really, 20th century infrastructure is, I think, wrought some of the, the worst damage on our cities um, in the history of mankind. And I just found this quote by the founders of Lyft, um, who are, they're a competitor to Uber, so they're a car company. But even they are saying it's time to redesign our cities around people, not cars. Over the last 50 years, urban development has centred around the automobile. But imagine for a minute what our world would look like if we found a way to take most of these cars off the road. Now, clearly they're promoting their own agenda. Um, but I think we all need to start thinking what is, uh, what is, a, a post automobile city like and what how can we dismantle some of the 20th century infrastructure dedicated to cars mm. so one of those examples was um, we looked at circular key now this was generated by uh, this is circular key today with the carl expressway so it's got a, a rail line on the the middle deck it's got cars on the upper deck um, you can see the construction of light rail, which is going to further congest an already highly congested and contested area. Um, and those of you who aren't from Sydney, um, there are uh, our major ferry terminal on the other side. And we just thought it was appalling that Sydney, which is a it's a, is a harbour city, um, is literally disconnected from the harbour. Um, and so we wondered how can we dismantle 
um, that infrastructure. But this exercise was spurred on by the state government who went out with a call. They wanted to spend 200 million um, beautifying, I think the word was, um, the Carl Expressway. And our feeling was, well, if you spend 200 million, you're locking in that structure um, for the next two generations. Uh, and why don't we start making moves to think about when could we dismantle it? And that may not be till 2050, but there are moves that we can make to dismantle it. And we just, if we have the long-term vision, then we can put in place the steps rather than just saying, yes, it's ugly, let's beautify it. So we looked at the public transport network. Um, the suburban rail line does loop around there, and that is a critical um, connection in the train network. It's not one that can be undone. But I'm showing in orange is a disused tunnel. And I'll show you that in, uh, these are historic drawings, but here's the disused tunnel coming off St. James. Um, there's also disused tunnels coming off Wynyard that uh, many of you might know are now, they're occupied by, uh, that's a car park. And we wondered if we could use this existing tunnel, which is about one third of the way to Wynyard, to create a loop of um, underground rail that is one block in from Circular Quay. And so we would move the rail away from the front and move it one block in. Um, there would be a rail station opposite the park there. So there would be a one block walk to the heavy rail from the ferry terminal. And the the Carl Expressway itself, the vehicular connection is easy to undo um, because when it was originally built, all traffic came over um, the Sydney Harbour Bridge, and which is on the west side of the city, and needed to cross over to the east side. But today we have the um, the cross city, sorry, the cross harbour tunnel, um, and so there is connection both to the east and the west, um, and there is no need for that east-west connection. So by doing that, it would allow us to create a major public space um, right on, uh, on our, our foreshore, uh, connecting our city to the harbour, and importantly, reinstating Customs House um, connection to the harbour, which I think is a historic connection that should never have been undone. And so it would transform this into this, a public space of national significance, celebrating where the first fleet landed, um, we, it would be a place of celebration and a place of protest and connecting uh, sustainable transport from ferries to light rail and connecting Customs House to the water. Um, you, know that, and then, um, you know, Philip, that uh, when Keating was in power, the Prime Minister offered to pay for that out of federal money. I didn't actually know that. Yeah, Keating offered to put the Carl Expressway underground to get rid of it. And the state government, because I think there was, you know, the, politi the politics between Liberal and Labor, the state government said, no, no, we like it. Thanks very much. Yes. And it, look, it just honestly, if um, if you go up to the Carl Expressway on any given day, there's virtually no cars. Mm. You can simply demolish the Carl Expressway. The bigger challenge is dealing with the rail. Yeah. But we're suggesting why not spend a million dollars on a study that, uh, we've found disused tunnels. Can we actually make that work? And we've looked at the gradients and believe it's workable. Um, how would we make it work for, look, this might be the second half of this century, but why don't we start thinking long-term, not spending a lot of money um, beautifying what's an um, extraordinarily ugly structure that disconnects yeah. us from the harbour? Absolutely. Um, and the last project's very quick, Adam, and I can see we're, we're close, we're running out of time. Um, but it looks at Park Street, which um, runs through the middle of our city. And that is Park Street today. It bisects Hyde Park uh, with a wide street. And it's also the widest east-west street um, in Sydney. It's 40 metres wide. It's a beautiful street. Um, and what do we do? We fill it up with cars and buses. Um, and we said, well, really, the infrastructure already exists in the form of the Cross City Tunnel to get from one side of the city to the other. Um, and look, that infrastructure actually went bankrupt and the state government bought it back. Um, we just wondered why don't we make the cross city tunnel free um, for all cars to move east-west in the city 
And that would give us the flexibility to simply close Park Street, reconnect Hyde Park, and we would move from this to this. So uh, reconnect Hyde Park and create a shared boulevard that could have um, public transport and pedestrianised east-west connector um, that complements what's being built um, north-south with um, George Street. And, you know, another view looking at uh, the, the, the damage of cars running through Hyde Park and uh, what could happen as a, a green boulevard running through the city. Um, so look, in, in summary, I think uh, we hope that what we're looking to do is create cities uh, and ideas that are more sustainable, uh, more resilient for our city um, and more equitable. Um, and they are just six projects that, as I said, we did pro bono. Um, I do want to acknowledge our very talented um, team at Bait Smart. These are obviously not all my work. This is a team of um, done from our office of very talented architects um, and designers um, who deserve a lot of the credit for um, pulling putting these ideas together. Um, so thank you, Adam, for having me on the isolation talk. That was awesome, Philip. I completely love it. It's really great to, um, I mean, it's nice to talk about big things, big picture, things that take time, things that um, require some effort, things that actually will make our city a better place. And I know that a lot, of, a lot of the time it's about trying to think about small things we can do, but it's important to think about the big things as well. I might get you to unshare your screen so we can see you again, Philip, and just have a bit of a sure. discussion. You're getting lots of love from everyone out there saying, these are great ideas, let's do them more often. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I think that's yeah, really- i some of those people to send good comments yeah, through. Yeah, 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 good, good, good. I'm glad you did. Yeah. I was just gonna say, I, I, um, I was lucky enough- Unshare it now? Yes, you're unsure. I was lucky enough um, to do a Churchill Fellowship a few years ago and I um, went and visited Enrique Peñalosa, who was the mayor of Bogota, and he did the most remark two of the most remarkable things I think I've ever seen in city making. The first one was, oh, three actually. The first one was he proposed and had running a public transport system across the city of Bogota in 18 months, which is yep. sensational. He secondly closed every golf club and turned it into a public park, which was amazing. <laughs> he, figured that, he figured that 2% of the population shouldn't own 90% of the land. And he also um, unfunded roads and funded uh, bike and pedestrian paths. So there's this fantastic photo I took where the, the road was a mud pit and the bike path and the, and the walkway were just beautifully paved and people were using them. It was just a really... Such, showed such great leadership. He lost his mayoralship um, because of those things, actually, uh, which was quite interesting that it was a short-lived mayor, mayoral position, but uh, amazing to think that he had that done in such a short period of time. Yep, and I think it was actually his brother who was the mayor before him that first um, introduced the idea of car-free days and closed the city and said Cyclidean. that it's for cycling only. Yep. Um, and people just loved it and they realised that um, that we should really design our cities for public transport and cycling. Um, and, yeah, I think he was the, the second mayor in that family and they really had a democratic vision of a more sustainable city and a much more equitable city. Yeah, absolutely. It was amazing. Actually. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just want to, do you want to talk a little bit about, there's a lot of discussion about the high-speed rail and about how likely that is to happen or not. Um, do you, I mean, I'm assuming you keep up with what's going on in high-speed rail in the country, in Australia. What do you think? Uh, look, uh, yes, I do keep up with it. Um, yeah, I think it's, as I said, it's there's too much focus on um, trying to use high-speed rail to revitalise um, regional areas. And I think the biggest problem in Australia when, when you try to stretch it from even Sydney to Melbourne, which are, I think it's about a thousand kilometres, um, it's, this, it's the distances are just too great and yeah. the investment cost is way too high. And so what we are looking at is something that's um, much, much shorter um, and is connecting existing centres of population. Um, I think if you looked at a similar example might be if you um, connected around Port Phillip Bay through Melbourne to Geelong, 
or if you in Brisbane connected down to the Gold Coast and possibly out to the Sunshine Coast um, into the sustainable kind of uh, networks, rather than trying to think how do we connect interstate cities mm. and revitalise regional areas. And I, I think, look, this idea of revitalising regional areas is uh, it's, it's an outcome of our uh, political boundaries in our system where we, you have an over-representation of people from regional areas in proportion to the population because there's many, many regional areas, um, but in proportion to the population, it's, they're over-represented. Mm. And so you, I guess politically people look at ideas to revitalise regional centres, but I think it's, it's like trying to hold back. Um, it's, it's like 100 years ago saying, well, we don't want to become industrialised and hold back the industrial revolution. Mm. I, I think really um, the 21st century is about cities and people moving to cities. And I think trying to put money into regional areas when everyone's trying to move to cities is um, uh, is a fallacy. Mm. I think it's so, also interesting to think about the fact that if we're trying to connect Brisbane to Melbourne, it's like trying to correct, connect across the entire European continent when actually we should be looking at more manageable scales of land, which is New South Wales, Queensland and Victoria looking just to, to deal with themselves in the first instance. Yeah. So I, I think we've never seen a high speed rail um, proposal like that. Um, there is one in New South Wales called, um, I think it's called the Sandstone Mega Region, um, which connects down to Wollongong, Sydney to Wollongong and up to the Central Coast. Yep. Um, but again, th that's political boundaries. Um, it's paid for by New South Wales. So, of course, Canberra being not part of New South Wales, doesn't get included in that high-speed rail link. So again, it's the idea of well, who's who's going to think of connecting Canberra, a different state, through New South Wales, um, and give us the infrastructure um, we really need. And look, I'm not against a branch down to Wollongong, but I think if we shared infrastructure between Canberra, Sydney, and Newcastle, well, we've got a very different view of the city and how how you allocate budgets yeah. rather than replicating airports and replicating hospitals and fighting for affordable housing, um, you have a different way to look at, at and conceive the city. Yeah. So then just a slightly different take, um, uh, just thinking about the density of our cities and I mean, I'm a big advocate of more uh, of, um, better density, more density, um, stop con concretizing our entire eastern seaboard. But what do you think the impact of COVID is going to have on our idea of density and the impact of city making and, you know, inner city CBD environments? Do you think it's going to have a significant impact on the way in which we inhabit commercial office buildings or...? Uh, look, um, I, I, I think it remains to be seen, Adam. I think, I think it will have a short-term impact. Um, but I, I think there's so many um, nations working out what is the solution to COVID that um, there will be a, a solution in the years to come. I don't think it will have a, a long-term impact on, on cities. There have been um, pandemics there before, there have been plagues, um, uh, but the city is, is very resilient. Um, like you, I'm, I'm a big fan of good density, um, which might be, that's density connected to transport and density where there is open space for people. Um, so yeah, I think the, the impact will be short term, but I think the the city and, and a good sustainable city is, is the future. Mm. Okay, well, thanks, Philip. We really appreciate it. I'm going to um, wrap you up there just so that we can I talk a little bit about what's happening next week. But thanks for really, you know, there's been lots of great um, thoughts through that and I think it just shows your commitment not only personally but as a practice to work in the city you love and uh, contribute to a, the betterment of that city so I want to thank you for that. Um, Thanks Dan. Coming up next Tuesday we have Philip Arnold which is going to be exciting I think lots of people in Sydney know Philip for those of you who don't know Philip and are not from Sydney you're in for a bit of a delight. Philip is an exceptional uh, has an exceptional mind and is an exceptional designer and I'm super looking forward to seeing him talk next Tuesday. Um, and next Thursday we have our first um, international speaker um, as recommended by um, Aaron uh, Peterson. Um, we have the Irish firm of Clancy Moore who actually won, I think it was the 
RIBA Young Architect of the Year a few years ago. Uh, exceptional work. Um, it's going to be remarkable. I thought we'd just reach out to them and ask them if they would do it. And they said, of course. So that's pretty exciting. Um, so we have them as our, our, our first um, international speaker. And, you know, as we kind of lead towards the end of this whole series, it'd be nice to um, start reconnecting again, at least back across, across the globe. But thank you everyone for listening. Uh, we really appreciate it. Again, if you have time, drop onto the Architects website bookshop. Uh, we have lots of stock and particularly lots of kids stock at the moment. So if you've got kids who want to learn about architecture, uh, give it a, hook us up and uh, I'm sure we can help you out. But uh, thanks and we'll see you next week on Tuesday.